Welcome everyone to U2 Spain, broadcasting live on YouTube. On today's show, I'll be asking three guests from the company Fresh all about the tax differences between Spain and Portugal. So join in on the live chat or if you're watching the video back afterwards in the comments below. There'll be loads of handy information and lively chat just for you from beginning to end. So stick around for the whole thing. You're all very welcome to U2 Spain. Still alive. Are you ready for the music? Let's dance. Oh yeah, well, just before we get chatting then, don't forget to sign up for free to our monthly newsletter on the website, u2spain.com. That address will be on screen most of the way through the show. And a very quick mention for our lovely friends at Smart Currency Exchange as well, whom I'm sure will be back on the show soon. And I recommend when you're moving or buying a house here, uh, use the link below to get in touch with them and get a free account with no obligation. That doesn't cost you a penny. And using the link helps you to Spain out too. It's a win, win, win with a cherry on top. There it is. So without further ado, let's meet our wonderful guests for today. First of all, then it's Zeev Fisher. Good morning, Zeev. Can you hear me okay, Zeev? We're getting no answer from you. Have we got have we got sound? Okay, I can't hear you at the moment, Zeev. What we'll do is we'll introduce everybody else and then come back to you. Is it working now? See if we can... Aha, brilliant, yeah, yes. Yeah, change my microphones and everything, it's fine. So good morning. Ah, good morning, how are you? Yeah, good, good, how are you? Yeah, not too bad today, not too bad. <laughs> and uh, let's move on to our Spanish tax expert then over in Barcelona. It's Marilo. Good morning, Marilo. Hello, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And very quickly, we'll get Pedro from Portugal on there. Oh. Good morning, Pedro. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning, colleagues from Fresh. Good morning, everyone in chat. Excellent. Let's say hello to just a few people on the chat. Let's see who's joined us before we get started then. Good morning to Robbo and uh, Kev the Argonaut. He's not going to make it today. He has a carload of women to get to a hen day in Brighton. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, good for you. We'll catch up later. There we go. And uh, Anton Kez are there and Ola Todas and Paul Cook and Steph and Alicante Explorer and Gary Gary Gary, who's in Huelva province. So wonderful, lovely to see you on the live chat and hello to everybody else who's joining. There's a bit of a delay as they all join up. So right then, let's find out a little bit about each of you and uh, we'll start with Zeev, because you're, uh, you're one of the partners, aren't you, at Fresh? Let's bring you up and you tell us all about Fresh and what you do. Yeah, so I'm a, a tax lawyer uh, by trade. I'm actually qualified in the UK uh, in Ireland. Uh, and uh, I uh, arrived in uh, Portugal during the pandemic and um, I'm sort of looking for tax advice and, and realised that I'm struggling to find the quality of tax advice that I'm used to. Um, or, or used to giving, ended up setting up shop and uh, uh, you know, three years later we're now uh, 10 lawyers at Fresh and uh, we've expanded to Spain and uh, Morello is leading our uh, operations in Spain and uh, yeah, I mean we're, uh, we're a law firm purely focused on the expat community. Excellent. That's a very good introduction. Right, Marilo, let's hear from you next. There you are. Okay, I am a tax lawyer in Spain. I, I have been working many times for uh, biggest uh, firms in, in Spain. And now I, I met, uh, I joined Fresh uh, last year and I do uh, taxes here in Spain. Excellent. Thank you for that. And finally, Pedro, let's hear from you. Well, hello everyone. I'm Pedro, tax lawyer. Uh, at Fresh Portugal. Well, uh, I have a, basically a broad uh, background on international taxation. 
uh, I have studied it in Brazil and in Portugal, and always with this grip on the cross border tax matters. So basically, that's my role in Portugal for any kind of planning, consultation, or disputes. And that's basically it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Right. So we know how you are. What I think we'll do is uh, we have a list of subjects to cover and uh, we'll we'll talk about what happens in Spain with one thing and then we'll talk about what happens in Portugal and compare the two. And um, Zeev, you can uh, butt in at any time and uh, add to anything that your, your colleagues are saying. Um, and uh, so we'll start. This is the first time that we've looked at any other country apart from Spain on the show. And we're doing it for two reasons, really, because I see comments on social media all the time, on the, especially on Facebook expat groups about Spain saying, oh, you should move to Portugal instead. It's much easier. The tax is lower. Everything's, everything's cheaper and lower. So we need to get to the bottom of that. And also, uh, your company, Fresh, uh, you're quite unique, aren't you, in covering both countries? So it's an ideal opportunity to do an accurate comparison by the experts. So we'll start with um, what are the differences then in between Spain and Portugal when it comes to tax thresholds, by which we mean how much you can earn before you start paying tax. So, so we start with Pedro, no, sorry, uh, Marilo. We'll, we'll start with Spain. We're on foreign <laughs> We're on foreign ground with Portugal, so we'll start where we feel most comfortable, I think. Here we go. So, Marilo, tell us about the tax thresholds in Spain. So, in fact, the thresholds um, in there, we are talking always in the personal income tax, so it really doesn't exist. So, there are thresholds to declare. So, but if you, uh, beginning with, if you are a tax resident in Spain, but if you are a tax resident in Spain and receive um, any income from abroad, any job income or retired uh, uh, income from the uh, pension of the social security, so there is not any threshold. So okay. in that case, so it's, it's nothing. So the only thresholds are when for a Spanish residents that uh, they don't need to declare if they has an income uh, lower than 22,000 euros. But in that case, the uh, company, the Spanish company, has made uh, payments on account on accountant. So this is only the these thresholds are only uh, linked to the obligations to 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 do the the regular tax forms. Excellent. Yeah, so basically you're paying tax from from the first yes. cent that you earn. Okay, so is that different uh, in Portugal, Pedro? Yeah, it's a little bit different. Uh, in Portugal, we have, uh, uh, as it's similar in Spain, a, a progressive rates and different brackets uh, for the income tax normally, with a few exceptions depending on some special rates, but the threshold to be taxed is actually, is actually established as basically a minimum to exist. Uh, it's a concept in, in the Portuguese law that states that if you earn about 11,000 euros uh, a, a year, uh, you can't be taxed. And to be more precise, accurate, it's 11,480 euros. It's the equivalent of 12 months of minimum salary in Portugal. So that's basically what, what can't be taxed by the Portuguese tax authorities. Anything that goes beyond that will be subject to taxation. And of course, uh, we are talking uh, uh, here about anything that is related to income that is aggregated, which means normally self-employment or employment income. Uh, as as Marilo also mentioned, depending on the streams of income, this uh, threshold will not be applied in, in, depending on how you choose to be taxed. But normally, that's the number to keep in mind. Okay, that's interesting. That's quite similar to the to the UK's yeah. tax threshold then. Okay, that's very interesting. So, anything to add to that, Zeev? Um, no, uh, yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe there are, there are um, 
I think we're, we're going to touch on that uh, at some point uh, later, but there are the tax benefit schemes. Um, and they, uh, I mean, it's not, it's not uh, the progressive rate thresholds, but uh, there are situations both in Spain and in Portugal where you pay no tax at all, but it's, it's because you are under an exemption scheme uh, and not, not because you, you hit a certain threshold. I think it's actually more interesting to people, you know, how to uh, minimize taxation. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. Okay, then. So it's not as basic as you might first seem, mm -hmm. then. That's, yeah. Okay, so uh, moving on then to uh, uh, allowances. Are, uh, are people better off in Spain, Marilo, for uh, allowances? Yes, allowances are for um, um, the taxpayers. So the, the minimum is uh, 5,500 euros. And then if you are older than uh, 70, so you can increase uh, for each year uh, 1,000 euros. And then if you have children, uh, depending on the age of the children and the, and the, the age of the, uh, all the children until uh, 25, also you can apply some allowances. And it's about... Uh, to 2,700 uh, per children. Yeah. And then if you have some disability, you can also have, uh, depending on the, the, the how is uh, it's uh, from 33% of these all ones. Mm -hmm. You can have, uh, it depends because you need to apply the, 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 um, the, the progressive uh, rates. So I can say it's uh, it's uh, 100 euros. So it depending of the, of the of your income, and uh, and nothing else. So the the most important allowances that that, that we have is uh, if you if you have an apartment and, and you rent this apartment to a, a family to, mm -hmm. to become the personal the, the permanent address is you have an allowance of uh, 50 percent. Okay. Um, nothing else. Great. Okay. Pedro, any differences with you in Portugal? So, and uh, actually the structure, uh, it's similar, just the amounts, they're uh, a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, but basically, you, normally there is a standard deduction if you have employment, self-employment or pension income, okay, that it's about 4,100 euros. Uh, to be uh, basically deducted as an allowance. You also have allowances for children and disabilities, but the amounts are lower than in Spain. Normally for children, it's about 500 euros only that, that you use as, a, uh, as an allowance. And uh, basically you have some deductions also uh, by the end when you estimate the taxes based on your own expenses, but they normally are quite low. Normally people who get the best deductions of these allowances of expenses, they are about a thousand euros. So uh, normally we don't count that much on these allowances. Uh, uh, I mean, assuming that your income will be much higher than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything to add, Steve? No. No, <laughs> you've got the easiest job here. Haven't you? <laughs> you can just sit back as the partner. That's great. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, we've had just a couple of questions come in, and they're both things that we're going to be covering later on in the show. So, Jason, yes, we'll talk about EPREM. Uh, that's uh, EPREM is actually spelt with an I at the start there. So, yes, we'll uh, talk about that later, and also about uh, pensions as a tax resident in Spain, yes, he's asking what are the tax allowances? Oh no, we're talking about tax allowances. Let's talk about that now, yes. Why not? So, do you get a Spanish tax allowance for UK state pension? I think you were just talking about that, weren't you, uh, Marilo? As a, tax, as a tax resident in Spain, uh, do you get a Spanish tax allowance for the UK state pension? So pensions, uh, the pensions, depending on the dual taxation treaty, and uh, if they are uh, not, usually if they are uh, public pensions, 
they are not taxed in Spain, but uh, we take the, the amount of that, that pension to, to find out which will be the tax rate for the rest of the pension of the income for mm -hmm. that person. And okay. if it's a uh, uh, pension that you receive from the social security, from a, a, a job, a private job, this pension is taxed in Spain because it's the country of the residency. Right. Great. So state state pension is state pension is is social is how how uh, the UK calls social security. Uh, to to confuse a little bit more, if possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I'm I'm sure I'll be very confused, but <laughs> by the end of the show. But uh, hopefully, lots of explanation as well. I've got a very fuzzy head today, so this taxation is just the perfect subject to talk about for me. <laughs> yes. But uh, yeah, John, if that doesn't answer your question, then by all means, ask for clarity in uh, in the live chat there. So next, let's talk about, uh, well, it's the big one, really, income tax. I'd, I'd put a bet on that income tax is higher in Spain. So uh, let's talk about the rates, Marilo, from your point of view. The, the rates. Um, it's difficult to, <laughs> to speak about rates in Spain because so it depends of in which uh, autonomous community uh, people uh, are living. Yeah. So normally, so we have uh, the we have a, a rank between the different regions, and uh, most for tax purposes is Madrid, and then is Canary, Andalusia, and Catalonia. Mm -hmm. Catalonia is the most most expensive, and the rates are from eighteen percent until uh, Madrid is, for instance. The minimum is 18% until uh, 43%. Yeah. Catalonia is until 52%. But it depends of big because there are different brackets. It depends of the level of your income. So yeah, um, it's difficult to say. And is there there's are there different rates for self-employed? I know there's a new sliding That's scale for self-employed. Self it's the same self-employed, so you you the the the, the income, so the, the 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 income from the activity is, is so you need to calculate the net income, is the income less the expenses, and then this net income is taxed with the same uh, with the same um, with the same tax rates of the of the of the tariff the. the tariff so it's the same it's not I see. okay the only difference is the because you need to calculate before the net income of the activity but then it's the same it's not different oh, i see and while you're employed it's the firm that you're working for that would be doing that for you uh, yes yeah yeah okay and uh pedro so tell us if there's any difference with you in portugal yeah, it's a, it's a little bit different, but not, not that much. They are rooted in the same basis. But uh, in Portugal, employment and self-employment income and pensions, uh, by standards, they are taxed by a progressive rate also, depending on the brackets that, that you find yourself. So uh, the brackets go from 7,000 euros a year to 81,000 uh, euros a year. And there will be rates varying between 13.25% and 48%. So it, it, it depending on how much you exceed this uh, 81,000, it can get very severe. Uh, there are uh, special rates applied to uh, capital income, which is an umbrella category that exists in Portugal, referring to dividends, interest that you receive. You can either choose to aggregate this income to your self-employment, employment, or pension and be taxed by the progressive rate, or you can choose to be taxed by a special rate of 28%. In this case, it's a flat rate, no deductions. Uh, for capital gains, uh, if they are derived from property, uh, they, you, you need to estimate half of the gain, okay, 50% of the gain, and they are aggregated through the progressive rate. Uh, if we're talking about rent, then it's normally a, a special rate of 25%, but 
uh, the length of the contract of rent can impact uh, in a severe reduction of this uh, uh, of this rate. It could reach up five percent for really long term contracts. Uh, if you hold uh, a special status as the NHR. Uh, a special rate of 20%, a flat rate of 20% might be available, uh, 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 might be available for you if you have self-employment and employment income. So instead of the progressive rate, you apply a special rate of a flat 20%. It sounds uh, to me, Zeev, like there's, there, there's ways of, of working your, your tax that you know, if, you, yeah, I, I, if somebody speaks to an advisor like you. Yeah, well, yeah I, I, I think, um, you know, to, to some extent, I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of listening. I, I, I get um, that you, you're trying to compare between Spain and, and Portugal as, uh, you know, which jurisdiction you end up paying, uh, uh, paying more. And um, perhaps we're frustrating you by telling you that it's complicated and it varies and changes from one person <laughs> to another, which is not a huge surprise coming from uh, from lawyers. The tax rates are not that far off from each other uh, if you just look at the headline uh, rates. But the, I, I think uh, our, our uh, so we're not accountants, right? I mean, this is what accountants do. They, they tell you how much tax you need to pay. This is not what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, our job is to figure out how to pay less. And uh, uh, in, in both countries, you have you know, various programs, various ways to, to structure your income uh in in a way that you will pay less so um i i think uh uh you know perhaps the right question for us is okay you know people come to us and say well here's my income this is how i make money from various sources well, what's the best way for me to, to structure uh it such that i will um, i will uh, optimize uh, my taxation and pay as, as little as legally possible and um and that's that's what we normally do and, and both countries offer interesting um, options in that sense. So, yeah, I mean, no, no one answer, uh, different answer for each person. Mm -hmm. I have a saying here that and I've, I, I flash it up on the screen quite a lot during lots of shows that any question you ask, certainly anything that you see asked on social media usually gets this answer from me. <laughs> it depends. Amazing, yes. yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah, because we, I, forgot, I forgot to mention that in Spain, so we have two different uh, um, uh, tax rates. This progressive tax, tax rate that is very high, I think is higher than in Portugal. And then we have the saving rate, rate that is for interest, dividends and capital gains, which is more cheaper. So it depends. So if you are a civil servant uh, in England that you want to come into Spain, and you all receive your pension from England, you don't pay nothing in Spain, and I think nothing in, in Portugal. But if, if this person receives dividends or interest, so he will pay 19%. So I agree with Zip that, uh, with Zip that uh, it's very difficult to compare both countries. Even it's different to compare two people in Spain, so because it depends on the income. Hmm. Well, that's good to hear, <laughs> even if it is confusing. <laughs> uh, Steffi is asking uh, if there's a link to where you can find the different tax rates for the different autonomous regions. Do you know where you'd find that, uh, well, Marilo? <clears throat> it's really difficult. <laughs> mm. It's really difficult, but I can, I can... We can post it on the website. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, and send it to me and I'll put it in the comments yes, yes. <coughs> below so people can find yes. it as well. Oh, it, it will have to be after the webinar. I mean, we can't post it right now. Oh, yeah, 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 no worries. <laughs> yeah, I would have trouble adding it right now. <laughs> yeah, great. And uh, Tony's asking about tax on investments. Uh, we'll talk about that later in the show, I think, Tony. So thanks for your question. And... Jason is asking a question about property tax. Oh no, that's tax on rental. Actually, that's no. Let's cover that one now because that is an income tax. Uh, so one for you, Marilo. I think if I own a property in Spain and rent it out, I will pay twenty-four percent tax on each rental, plus the same in non-residence tax. What is the rental tax in Portugal? and non-resident tax. 
Okay, so this is talking about its income tax uh, for yes. residents yeah, and non-residents. Uh, if it's rent, that, as I mentioned before, it will be 25%, but uh, as I also mentioned, it depends on the length of the contract. So okay. a, a very long rental contract, this, this is uh, this always been the case, but uh, the last government has, has further reduced the, the rent of um, taxes uh, for very long-term rentals to encourage more properties going into the rental market. And the, the lowest rate in, uh, in uh, Portugal now is 5%. Uh, which is the rate for rentals over 20 years. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if, if someone's looking for a sort of a solid long-term uh, investment instrument where, where they pay very low tax, but they also can't raise the rent too much, uh, then uh, property in, in Portugal is, is, uh, is good for this purpose. Excellent. hope that answers your question, Jason. So, uh, <clears throat> 24% is for non-European uh, countries. If, if I don't know we, where, where uh, this person lives, if not, is that 19%? I, I mean, I'm not sure what it means by non resident tax. Um, oh, that's if you've got a holiday property that you own in Spain yes. but you live in the UK. So, this person yeah. lives abroad and has a, a house in, in Spain that rent. So that that's that's what I that's what I thought, but I don't I don't understand why where he sees the double taxation. Uh, I mean, why, why does it? Oh, this is, I, I think this isn't, um, he's not talking about income tax. That's actually tax on property itself. There's property tax and there's income on that you make from a property. Two different things, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, because if if is a person that lives in UK and has a house in Spain, so the income from the house will be taxed in Spain, 24%. And then he needs to declare also that income in England. But the, 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 the tax paid in Spain can be deducted in England. So there yeah. is no taxation. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I was trying to figure, that, figure out whether he's speaking about taxes in, in both countries or whether he sees some sort of a double taxation um, in, in Spain. I mean, it, it wouldn't be. I mean, it would be either this or that. If, uh, if it's taxed as a rental, it wouldn't be taxed uh, in the income uh, as, as an income. And if it's taxed as an income, it wouldn't be taxed as a rental. And then if he, li if he lives in another country, then he needs to pay tax in that country, but everything paid in Spain will be deductible from that. Yes. Uh, so it's not, uh, there, there's, no, there's no double taxation in that sense. No. You, could, you would end up paying, paying tax in more than one country, but you always pay the higher of the two. Uh, yes. It, yeah, unless there's no double taxation treaty, uh, and that also happens. But I, I doubt if uh, many of your listeners uh, are, are living on you know, islands in the Caribbean or something like that. <laughs> Not that I know of, but if, if anybody is, then please tell us on the live chat and, yes. and, and invite me to your island. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, oh, yes, Jason's got a further question, I think, based on what you've said. Is there a non-residence tax in Portugal? So he's, he owns, if I own a property in Portugal, but don't live there, I rent it out. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, Andrew, but but basically it's uh, what we I was talking about. Uh, even if you are a non-resident, if you have rent coming from Portugal, this is income sourced in Portugal. Therefore, it's taxed by the twenty-five percent rate that I have mentioned. I, I I'll I'll just I'll just jump in and say so. Yeah, I mean, th there's no such thing as non-resident tax uh, yeah. in the tax code. It's it's tax on rental, um, and and that is the tax that applies to people who don't live uh, in the country. And so it, it would be the same. Uh, it would be the same in Spain. Uh, that, uh, if you own a rental property, you will pay tax in the country where the property is one way or another. Yep. And one, one thing that uh, if someone is considering buying, for example, a holiday home uh, in either Portugal and Spain, uh, one thing to consider is uh, always, uh, it, and it's not right for everyone, but it's something to look at, is put, putting it within a, a corporate vehicle. Uh, so uh, you, you can set up a company uh, in the country, the respective country where the property is, and then the, the company can own uh, the property, and then you don't pay uh, tax or rental; you can, you'll pay corporation tax. And uh, you know, sometimes sometimes it, it leads to to a lower tax, and sometimes it leads to a higher tax. Back to it depends. Uh, in in Portugal specifically, uh, there is a benefit uh, in in setting up companies when you own property on the island, properties on the islands. 
So it's just, you know, something to look at uh, when, when you're considering your investment structure. Uh, it's something to look at. So is there not a separate charge, kind of an annual charge for having a property in Spain or in Portugal, for example? Oh, there is. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what he means by non-resident tax. That's, but that's not like the income tax that you're, that no, you're it's not, from. Yeah, well, the, the annual charge doesn't have anything to do with your residency status. Um, it, you just, you know, it's like you pay for the ownership of, uh, I said, you know, a very small percentage to, for the privilege to own a property. It's, I think, again, it's the same in both countries. Yeah. Okay. Whether, uh, whether you're a resident or not, it doesn't matter. Okay. Great stuff. Uh, let's... Oh, a point. A point on that. I mean, I, I don't. I don't actually know what the situation in Spain about this is. In in Portugal, there is a tax break. Um, if you buy a property to renovate, and actually, not many people, even people who live in Portugal, not many people know that. Uh, but there's a huge tax break uh, when you buy a property to and, and you renovate it and you raise the energy efficiency in two levels. So you like you. It's. Uh, the government wants to encourage people to, 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 in order to meet its energy targets, uh, to improve properties from an energy, energy perspective. And if you buy property and you renovate, raise the energy efficiency, they, they compensate you in two ways. Uh, one is they give you back the purchase taxes, which are a lot of money. Um, and and the, the second is that they give you a, a three to five year exemption uh, from paying these, this annual tax. So, so, so that, that that's related. So, anyone considering sort of a purchasing a property as a, to to do it up um, needs to take that, or you know, needs to think about this break and take it into account. Okay, that's very good to know. <clears throat> um, so, I was going to be talking about I've got in my notes to talk about non-residence tax, but we've already said it's, there's, there's there's no difference. Um, I I thought there was a difference in Spain of uh, you'd pay 19% uh, tax rate if you live in Spain as a resident, but 24% if you're not living in Spain. No, it's, if, you are, if you are not resident, depending on the country where you are living, uh, you pay 24 or 19. 19 uh, is for European countries and 24 is for non-European countries. Uh, I see. I think that's what we're talking about when when everybody's talking about non-residence tax. It's, yeah. These are people who are from outside of Europe. I think it's because all of our audience are from uh, most of our audience are from the UK, yeah. so right. no longer in the EU. So yeah, that, that's just rental tax, right? I mean, just mm. tax tax on rent. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, maybe maybe it's just a it's just a semantics and, and terminology, but uh, mm. you know. When you say non-resident tax, I, I, I don't necessarily think about property. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's tax on rent and, and, the, and the regime is different whether you're a resident or a non-resident or could be different. Mm. Okay, I hope that covers everything. Oh, Jason says yes, exactly. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so uh, uh, is there... Uh, yeah, also what's the difference in, in Portugal? Is there that difference? I think you mentioned 25% before. Yes, Did you, Pedro? exactly. But uh, if, if we are talking about taxes on non-residents, uh, we can think about someone who comes to work in Portugal or is a self-employed in Portugal, although not resident, but working from here somehow, and uh, they, they will be taxed on 25% also. It's a flat rate, okay? Uh -huh. and, and the only difference that I can think of on that it's the capital gains derived from the selling of a property, of a real estate property in Portugal, because these capital gains will follow the same rationale of the residents. So yeah, you need to aggregate 50% of the uh, of the gains and, and be taxed through the progressive rate. Great. Um, Mr. Lower Log, oh no, uh, we have a question about capital gains tax. This is something we get regularly on programs about tax and property. So he's uh, he or she possibly moving to Spain, but delaying their move until after July from the UK. Will this stop capital gains tax on our house sale in Spain um, and the lump sum? Yes. Will it stop capital gains tax and the lump sum being taxed in Spain next year? Uh, yes, because in that in that uh, case, uh, if you if you if you became tax resident in Spain, 
and you sell a house, uh, a, for, uh, a foreign house in the UK, you will be taxed in Spain. So if you delay until you came here in, in, in August 2024, mm -hmm. and, and, and this person sell the house in 2024, uh, this, this capital gain will be taxed only in, in the UK, not in Spain, because 2024 is not resident in Spain. So I, I was the 183 days uh, to be a resident in Spain. So yeah, I, I think Marilo read the question correctly, and and I didn't. But you know, when I read it again, it's it's not actually a hundred percent clear to me. I mean, I think that he means a house in the UK, but it's yep. not hundred percent clear to me. So if if it's a house in the UK, then yes, uh, if, if it's if it's a tax resident in the UK and the house is in the UK, they wouldn't he wouldn't pay any taxes in Spain. But I mean, it doesn't make sense for him to sell the house in Spain. But if he happens to be talking about the house in, in Spain, then no, it won't stop it because uh, the uh, pro real property is taxed in the country of where it's based. Yeah, but I thought yeah. that the house is in the UK. Yeah, no? yeah I think you're right. I think yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yes, if the house, so the uh, property ta property tax is always in the country where, where the property the house is. is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it, there is a, a slight uh, addition that I'd like to make to that. If you've spent, if you've already spent two or three months in Spain on holiday while you were while you were waiting before you actually moved, that counts towards the 183 days that you that you've spent in Spain in that year. And therefore, if you move in, say, August, and you've already spent a few months here, then, yeah, then you, you would become paid. tax resident, a fiscal resident, yeah. yes, and you would end up paying. So just be careful about that. Yes. Good stuff. Uh, oh, right. perhaps a, a point that we missed about holiday homes uh, okay. is that uh, in, in Portugal, if you have a holiday home and you operate it as a uh as a short-term rental property then you, you don't uh, you don't exactly have uh, income from a property you have income from a business uh, so the whole tax calculation is completely different um so it, it's treated as a business with with a certain coefficient applied and certain expenses assumed um and, and the, the effective tax rate actually depends on how well you operate it <laughs> right yeah Sounds like people should come to you uh, to come to your company and talk talk in depth about <laughs> these things if they've got their big decisions to make. It is Spain is the same. The difference is between tourist house and, 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 and permanent house is that you have a tax allowance of fifty percent if if the, if the house is 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 like a permanent address of the of the tenant. If mm -hmm. not, if it's as a tourist, you pay one hundred percent of the net income. Or the gross income if you are not tax resident. Great. And Marie Dai is asking, I think we may have answered this one, but are you taxed in Spain if you're a resident there and you sell a property in the UK and you receive a UK pension? I think that's a simple yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> if but you're a tax resident. For, for the property, uh, you first pay in the UK. Yes, um, and if there's you only pay in Spain if there's anything left. So you have to you have to think about the, you know as if the house was a was a house in Spain, and and then deduct everything paid in the UK, uh, and see what if if you have anything left and, and you pay the remainder to Spain. Uh, UK pension is not under the treaty is not taxed in the UK at all. So all of the tax goes goes to Spain. Yes. yes. Yeah, unless it's. Um... Uh, UK pension paid by the government. Government, yeah. No, or yeah. unless unless you're under Beckham. Uh, <laughs> no, we'll talk about Beckham's law after the break. That's a that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, great. I'd, well, I think we we may be past halfway through the show. So what I'm going to do is go on to the mid-show break, which is just a, a few minutes. So you can uh, refresh your coffees over there. Uh, and um, so let's have a quick message all about the wonderful things available to you as watchers of U2 Spain. And we'll be joined by all of my alter egos and the voices in my head for this little advert. So see you all in a few minutes. Are you getting the most out of U2 Spain? I don't 
Oh, no! Did you know that apart from these Saturday morning live shows with expert guests or expats with really exciting stories to tell, it's like the Graham Norton Show. Bah! There are videos every Wednesday evening packed with all the information you need so we can move to Spain and enjoy living here without paying tax. No, Colonel, that's illegal. But you can find out how to navigate the bureaucracy successfully. Well said, Walter. How do I find the videos? Just subscribe to the YouTube channel, darling. And click on the bell, you useless Colonel. There's a playlist here called Video Diaries. Oh, now that is Scatz's thrilling personal story about his life and health in Spain. Still alive! Hashtag FOF. You can support you to Spain as well, my darlings, if you think you've learned something valuable. Or if you've been entertained. Sketch looks like he needs your support. The poor bugger can't even stand up. If he was a horse, I'd shoot him. Colonel! He's not a very nice man. It's all right. He's just a two-dimensional stereotype. Aren't we all, sweetie? I'm not. Brexit! Moving on! So how do we support you to Spain? Use the QR code in the corner. Oh, there's a link in the video description below. Oh, I can't find it anywhere, darling. In the video description, you idiot. I've warned you, Colonel. I'll send you back to the nunnery. <laughs> While you're watching or pausing below the video, you'll see the title just here. Oh, I see it. Not far below that, there's a description of what the video is all about. It says, read more. That's right. Just click or tap on that and lots more text appears. What's the information all about? There's contact information for the expert guests and lots of links to other related companies that I recommend. And they help out you to Spain if you use those links to get in touch with them. There's so much down below. Ah! Does anyone have a pen? No need, Tommy. You can find everything on our website. YouTubeSpain.com And don't forget the Facebook page. And the YouTube Spain community group. Where you can talk to other people like you. Well, there's no one like me, sweetie. Thank goodness. Is that everything? There's a guest waiting to tell me things. Oh, I do like things. Where's Doogie Dog? That used to be his line. I'm stuck behind a wall. Oh, sorry, Doogie. I'll I'll come and find you after the show. Thank Oh, they finished. They finished early. <laughs> Sorry about that. That happened last that, week. I better that check was that ama out. That's amazing what we've just seen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so good. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> <We're> wasted. <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> well, yes, if you want any adverts made for fresh, then uh, I'm available. <laughs> you're, you're the, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, it's, uh, it's so energetic and funny. It's great. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So if anybody wants to, if anybody wants to speak to any of those characters and voices, then, <laughs> then do send me a message, because and and I'll I'll tell them. Right. You can <laughs> so, get in. You can get into character, but you need an office. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Still yeah. alive. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can jump in and out anyway. So, good. So, what were we talking about next? Uh, should we talk about pensions? Who's got the Who's got the best pension rate then? What about you? Marlow, what's the Spain's pension rates? How much do you get? Uh, the, the pension rates are the same of the job income, so there is no difference. The only difference is if the, the, the source of the, or, or the origin of that pension. Usually, if it's a public pension, so this is, this, that pension will not be taxed in Spain. Mm -hmm. And if it's a pension from the social security, uh, the pension will be taxed in Spain, but the rates are the same for for the the same as the job income or the economic activity. So, do you know what the if you got the Spanish pension? Do you know how much that is? The Spanish pension, the, the rate. Spanish state pension. Do you the, know how? Do you mean the rates? Uh, I mean, how much you would get per per month or per year if you got the Spanish pension? Uh, so it depends of the of the previous contribution. So the maximum I think is uh, 200, 500 euro, two thousand five hundred euros per month. Okay, let's see. Is that any any different, uh, Pedro in in Portugal? 
So and uh, yeah, it, it's a bit different in the sense <clears throat> that the the basically pensions are by default uh, taxed by progressive rates uh, if they are from Portugal. Uh, it, it it is a little bit similar to Spain in the sense that uh, depending of the tax treaty, if it exists and the provisions of it, you might not be taxed by a governmental pension and anything related to social security normally it's taxed in portugal but it is also taxed in the country that it's paying you if it is assuming it's a foreign pension and uh by by, by means of saying how much you get from uh, the portuguese social security it's it's normally pretty low uh i know that minimal amount it's 320 euros a month and the average of it, it's about uh, a thousand and, and a trend eight hundred euros uh, uh, for most people who have contributed for a long period of time. You might have, you might get an increase on that through the social security if you choose to contribute more, uh, more than what you need to. But it's pretty rare. The the, the algorithm to calculate it is extremely complicated. <laughs> you surprised yeah. me. <laughs> you, account, you know, contribution over a very long period of time, but also what your contribution contributions were in the last few years. Yeah. So sort of it gives you it gives an, an it, yeah, and, and it's like it, it's it's basically kind of trying try kind of balances. If you had a very high salary at the end, you get some credit for it, but not full credit. Uh, and and you have to go go and look back. It, it's actually I think Pedro is being slightly unkind to the the Portuguese social security system. It's actually pretty good uh, compared to other places. Mm -hmm. But the actual basic pension that you get for for having reached the maximum number of years is lower than Spain. Then. It's not it's not like in uh, it's not like in the UK where you have state pension for everyone and it's the same amount. Um, it's uh, it's 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 calculated based on how much you've contrib uh, contributed. So it's it's personal for each person. Yeah. Oh, okay. There uh, is a minimal, yes, that it's the three hundred and twenty, which uh, a lot of people, a lot of pensioners get in Portugal, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was going to ask next about social security payments, um, but as you've said, it's very very complicated. I think we'd need a whole program just for that. Oh, paying is easy. Pay the payments are easy. Uh, it's receiving the money that's uh, complicated. Uh -huh. Paying is very easy. Um, yeah, and it's a lot in both countries. It's very, very expensive. It's very difficult. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know as a self-employed person, they've, the, the, the new system that there is for working out how much you pay per month. Ah, yeah, yeah. the new system depends, uh, depends on how much... Uh, do you do you get each month so mm. it's, it's crazy yeah yeah yes it's crazy it's, it's probably worth mentioning again in, in that context that um yeah for, for most people there's not that much you can do about it you know if, if you're if you're employed or self-employed the social security is what it is and uh, and, and it's just another tax um and, and countries don't like to talk about the fact that you need to pay social security they say oh we've we've created all of this system of tax incentives and you only pay so much tax and they just don't mention that you also pay social security that is another tax and it's normally more uh, but um social security doesn't apply to profits from companies so let's remember that for a second uh, that people have flexibility how to uh, construct their uh, their affairs and um, uh, specifically people who have businesses. So if, if, someone's, if someone's coming to Spain or Portugal to work for a Spanish Portu or, or a Portuguese company, so you know, first of all, uh, uh, congratulations and thank you for contributing to the, to the respective countries. Uh, second, we're sorry for you. Uh, we know it's tough. And, and third, um, you know, mo a lot of people are not in this position. They, they have a business and the business may keep running uh in in the country of uh of origin and now they need to decide how to how to structure their uh, uh their issues a lot of people think and you know, some people work for a foreign employer and they don't realize that then they when they move to a, to a different country they can't keep being employed uh, by a foreign employer uh, in most cases so uh, uh, there are certain conditions where you, for example where you don't become a tax resident where, where that works or where you travel uh, to work on regular, uh, like all the time and on a regular basis where, where it might work, 
But in most cases, for most people, remote work isn't really, uh, remote employment isn't really a viable uh, long-term solution because it's illegal. Um, so uh, uh, that's what uh, employers of record are for. So people can work for employers of record. It's like companies that are, are paid to hire them in a, in a different country. Uh, or they can restructure a self-employed that also that also works in, in some some circumstances. But sometimes they can restructure as a, as a company. So they can have a company uh, either in, in Spain or Portugal or, or in another country. Um, and then that, that company uh, pays corporation tax and, and pays them dividends. And in, in, these, in this case, that there isn't necessarily social security. So again, there's flexibility on this. Ah, now that is interesting. We've got uh, Tony Brown on the live chat is asking, this is uh, from what I think you said before, Marilo, about um, uh, below 22,000 you don't uh what is that so just to clarify if i have a uk personal pension do i not pay tax up to twenty two thousand? no i think that uh, this uh, question is confusing because 22 is uh, in order to declare but uh, you declare if you, if you have been working for a spanish company and the spanish company ha uh, has withheld part of your salary but if you receive a pension from the UK and you you should pay in Spain, so there is not that threshold. So you need to pay and to apply the the, the, the tax rate, and mm -hmm. depending on who which is the the, the, the tax rate, you that person uh, will pay taxes in Spain. So that it's not true that uh, twenty two thousand is not true. Yeah, but there are allowances, so you don't pay tax on the first. Yes, uh, so uh, maybe for the first uh, 12,000 uh, euros, you, don't, you pay zero, but it's, it's a very, very low, uh, very yeah. low income. That actually answers Alan's question as well. He's saying, so if the UK pension is now about 10,000, if this is your only income, will you pay tax in Spain? Right. And if not, do you still have to declare it? We win everyone. The UK pension is now what? If ten thousand income, mm. will you pay? Probably you won't. Um, you don't pay nothing, but you need to declare. Yeah. So even if you don't pay taxes, you sh have the obligation the to 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 file the the personal income tax. <clears throat> yeah, and yeah. unless you're unless you're under Beckham, so uh, you I know. Am. It's it's rare for uh, for pensioners to be under Beckham. Um, normally, they, they wouldn't be because it's for Beckham is for working people, uh, mm -hmm. but it is possible. So uh, you know, it, it's not it's not un, it's not an impossibility that someone has already is already in retirement age and they're getting a pension and they still work and they have a job. Um, it's it's definitely a possibility. And for very wealthy people, it's might it might be worth getting a job just for this. Think about this for a moment. If someone has uh, both, you know, say pension and retirement savings, uh, and they're very rich, uh, or you know, mildly rich, and uh, and they they want to protect their pension and retirement savings, uh, they they could get themselves a job and get under Beckham, and and this way exempt their foreign income. That's a very good point. So let's let's move on to talking about about Beckham and the difference between um, uh, Spain and Portugal there because the, the Beckham's law is is a Spanish one isn't it but Portugal have a have a different one let's talk about the, the Beckham's law first Marilo what's the what's the tax on that so Beckham law is a tax system for for people that resist in Spain that are a tax resident but for the first time so they can apply the Beckham law and the Beckham law only tax the Spanish source income, so the uh, uh, dividends from abroad or income or uh, capital gains from abroad are not taxed in Spain. The only thing that is taxed worldwide is the job income. The tax rate is a flat rate, 24 percent. And also uh, people that are under Beckham law don't pay wealth tax, which is uh -huh. important. The wealth tax is only if they have some properties in Spain. Right. And this uh, system applies uh, 
the first year of the of the of the application and the following five years and you can so the person that is entitled to have this uh the, the Beckham law is the person who came to spain to work or to do something uh, as an entrepreneur or a, as a director and for the legal spouse as well mm -hmm. so that's interesting and you have to actually apply for that rather than it's not something that's automatically applied if you're earning a certain amount sorry so you have to actually uh, apply to be taxed under the Beckham's law. If you apply, yeah. So it's voluntary. So you can apply or not. You, you have you have to apply. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what then in Portugal is the T I S R I, Pedro? So, so Andrea, the treasury is basically uh, a, a kind of a replacement to to the NHR. Uh, however, it's a bit different from it, and basically it brings most of the benefits that, from the NHR, the, the previous tax scheme that existed in Portugal until uh, the end of the year, and currently it's under a transitional period, but uh, this read, it's basically establishing law and it will, it, it will remain. Uh, the difference between uh, both of them is that uh, although it resembles the benefits from the NHR, which means exemption from most of the of the foreign income that someone uh, will get if they are tax residents in Portugal, the difference uh, it is that if uh, in order to qualify for TISRI, uh, um, adding up to the previous requirements of not being a tax resident in the previous five years in Portugal and being a tax resident in Portugal in the year that you are applying, uh, you also have to qualify in one of uh, the re new requirements of the, uh, of the law that were established in the previous budget law. And these requirements refer normally to positions that you need to hold with certain uh, companies that benefits from certain investments in Portugal that they are all certified. Uh, you need to have a qualified profession normally correlated to university professors or people who work with uh, a technology and they must be employed in Portugal. Uh, uh, also, there is a possibility which uh, in fresh we see as the most viable one that it is to work for a recognized and certified startup. So uh, if, if you find a uh, recognized and certified startup in Portugal offering you a job, it's uh, actually a good thing to move and, and, and be hired by it. And also the board members of this uh, certified startups have uh, the benefits from this rate. And also there is a provision uh, as a requirement, one of those requirements, that if you hold a certain position uh, uh, in the islands in Portugal, in Madeira and Azores, uh, uh, you could benefit from TISRI. However, we're still waiting for Madeira and Azores to regulate this, this, this provision, basically give us uh, more guidance on what is necessary to have in Madeira and Azores. Uh, it's basically being a tax resident where I need to work there, uh, what, what is needed in order to uh, enjoy TISRI. So uh, as soon as we have more clarity on the island aspects and we do have some clarity on the other requirements, uh, we'll have a clear picture of who will benefit from this rate. Uh, but well, it's a good possibility. It seems to be uh, a good uh, a strategy for those who are coming to Portugal to try to find out where they can fit on it. Because uh, as I said, uh, if you were uh, working in Portugal, you have uh, similar benefits that came from the old NHR, that it's a flat rate of 20% applied to your income. So maybe you escape the progressive rates and, and the 48% that, that might come with it. And also uh, you get an exemption on most of the foreign source and income. Well, maybe, uh, you know, if I, if I can jump in, um, so there's a, there's an interesting competition um, between countries on on people who earn a lot of money, uh, and uh, it's um, uh, the, the the countries tend to try and balance two things. Uh, on one hand, they try to bring in talent, so you know, pe talent uh, uh, is is people who are still working and are needed in the economy, and they don't they don't tend to come to to fifty percent. 
tax rate. So it doesn't, these sort of things, they don't tend to impact retirees so much. I mean, they used to be targeting retirees, but at one point countries started saying, oh, hold on, hold on. We don't really want uh, uh, retirees as much as we want um, people who are still working and, and can, uh, uh, can contribute to the economy. So there's been a shift with less and less uh, tax benefits targeted at, at retirees and more tax benefits uh, targeted at uh, people who are still working. And then people who are still working, they, they don't like the tax rates of 50% or plus social security and so on. So the, the, these countries, they, they try and kind, kind of carve out um, certain, uh, certain types of people that they want to attract. They tend to be in certain jobs. They tend to be in certain uh, industries. So in, in Tisri and, and Beckham are actually quite similar in a lot of ways. You know, so some of them are targeted specifically at the tech industry, which all countries want to encourage. Um, but what, what happens is that they, the countries, they kind of, they create these schemes, but they don't think them through initially. Um, so they, they just, they do something to, to, to say, oh, you know, we've done this to, to encourage the economy. And then the, the political parties start getting pushback from, from the local population uh, saying, you know, why should we give tax benefits? So they try and figure it out. And then for a long time, after a scheme is introduced, you, there's some lack of clarity as to how exactly it works. So it happened in Spain. Uh, the Beckham law has existed for a long time, but it was only relevant uh, uh, for people who are moving uh, by, by multinationals, for example. And then a, a year and a half ago, or so, you know, roughly, uh, Spain decided to open Beckham to digital nomads. Um, so uh, under the digital nomad visa, which a lot of people qualify to, you, you, have, you now have access to, to Beckham. Uh, but for until a few months ago, uh, the scheme existed, but the forms didn't exist. So you couldn't actually apply for it. Now, the, the scheme was in place, but, uh, but you couldn't file an application and there is an application deadline. Uh, so recently Spain said, well, you know, everyone was caught in this, uh, in this situation. We will let them apply uh, until June 2024 and, and get into the scheme. Um, and, and that's great, but you know, you, they still haven't clarified whether you need to work in Spain or not. Um, and and uh, the, 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 the kind of, in a non-published way, yes, you still need to work in Spain, uh, but you, you can get into that scheme. So it's more clear now, but still not entirely clear. And what's happening in Portugal is the same. So uh, we, we used to have NHR. NHR was a very straightforward scheme. Uh, everyone can get it. Uh, it applies differently to different people, but you just take a box and every new tax resident, they, they take a box and they're in and it exempts their foreign income. And, and to some people, it also gave benefits on, uh, uh, on work income. And then the, the socialist government in Portugal decided to scrap it because the, uh, they thought that it will help them stay in power. Ironically, it didn't. So they, they scrapped the NHR and two, two months uh, later, they fell for different reasons. Um, but uh, yeah, okay, so it's gone now, and uh, and yes, there's a transition period to people who already started moving to Portugal, but they've they've had a lot of pushback from the tech industry saying nobody's going to want to come to Portugal without this. Uh, so they've introduced a scheme that mainly benefits uh, the islands and the tech industry, but they haven't. Uh, it, it requires either being on the islands or being certified as a startup, but they haven't sorted out the certification of startups or the certifications of investors that also certify startups, or the, or the island criteria. None of these things works. Uh, but it's just a matter of time. So in, in a few months, probably, or, you know, uh, you never know uh, how long things take in, in Portugal or Spain, but probably uh, within between a few months and a year, uh, it will work. Um, and then it, it would be, uh, it would be and, and I suspect there will be some transition for period or caught in the interim as well, because this is what happened in Spain and Portugal mm -hmm. to do that, uh, to, to do these transition periods. I mm -hmm. think I will say, um, depending on people's, generally people who are working uh, and, and have uh, um, some flexibility as to how to structure their income, there's always a way. Um, so, you know, we, every time the government changes something, they tend to change things for the worse. Not always, but they, they tend to ch change things for the worse. Then we, we have to sit down and brainstorm and figure out how we beat that. Uh, and, and we always do, because this is, what, this is what tax lawyers are for. So there's always something to do. And there's always some way to, to structure things in a way. I mean, so it, it, it means you have to jump through hoops sometimes. Uh, but uh, if, you're, if your income is not like fixed and paid by a certain source every month, but it's something you can 
tweak to, to meet the changing criteria, then there's a lot you can do. Uh, if, if, you, if you're uh, retiring uh, and you're getting, uh, you know, you're reliant, you're reliant on state pension, for example, your flexibility is very limited. And then, uh, yeah, you might want to consider going either to the country that you like the most, the one that offers you the best lifestyle, or the country that gives you the best tax benefits. Uh, and if you're very lucky, they agree with each other, it's the same country. But for a lot of people, they, it, it doesn't. And, and at the moment, uh, both Portugal and Spain, uh, Spain's better for retirees because in, in Portugal, the, the door for a good, for a lot, from a tax perspective, the door for, for low taxation to retirees is shut at the moment. Uh, in, uh, in Spain, the, there is a door uh, for low taxa no taxation to retirees, which is getting into backup. It's counterintuitive. Retirees are not supposed to be under backup. Uh, but if someone is retiring and they, and they are wealthy enough, uh, they, they can get themselves under Beckham anyway, and their uh, uh, their pension income will be covered uh, by Beckham, and it would it would not be taxed, and it's also it, it would also they would also not need to declare it, right, Marilo? Yes, uh, Beckham law. Um... So it, uh, I agree with you that Beckham law is very difficult because uh, Spain has opened new cases as a nomad digital, but they don't have the regulations because the problem with the Beckham law for nomad digital is that the, the social security. So the employer should pay the social security in, in, in the country of the origin of in, or in Spain. So we have a lot of problems with that uh, digital nomad. And now they are working in the, in the regulations uh, with regard to the social security. For a type uh, people, it's very difficult to apply the Beckham law. But the most beneficial, for for my point of view, is the people is very healthy, so they need to apply for the Beckham law to avoid the wealth tax, because the problem for people that come into Spain is the wealth tax for rich people, and if they are under Beckham law, so they can uh, they can avoid this, this tax. So. Mm. so imagine Andrew, someone like you, you know, extremely rich. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I imagine that every day. <laughs> and you have you have uh, uh, you have your assets in the UK now. You have your your property empire and and your shares and everything. And you decide that you want to come to Spain for for the lifestyle uh, and and your enjoyment. And your default position would be. Uh, if you're if you're not if you don't have any European passport, your default position would be to apply for the non lucrative visa, and, and and that would get you in. Uh, but but under that visa, you're not supposed to work. Um, and if if you're thinking of it in a, you know in a slightly more creative way, um, because you're so wealthy, for you to set up a company to do something in Spain or even in the UK, um, and and place you in Spain as a, as an employee. Uh, and uh, pay, pay you a salary and social security, it's peanuts, it's nothing. You know, you're just uh, setting up a company and paying yourself a salary, considering your wealth is, is no effort at all. And, um, uh, and, and once you've done that, you, you, you can access Beckham through the digital nomad visa. So yeah, I mean, retirees are not used to thinking of themselves as, as the digital nomads, but uh, the, the legislation is not ageist. It doesn't preclude people from being digital nomads because they're old. Uh, and, and want to retire. It's a, it's a matter of, do you meet the criteria? So, so sometimes you just have to look, yeah, I mean, the, the non-lucrative uh, visa was designed for retirees, um, and, uh, uh, and, and normally pension income is taxed, but, but the tax benefits uh, cover uh, pension income uh, if, you, uh, if you structure uh, your, your, your matters in, in such a way. And a lot of people uh, who are moving from, from the UK to, I mean, yeah, I mean, some, some a lot of people are moving, and, and the, you know they're not in, the, in this fortunate position. But a lot of people who are moving, they, they do have uh, um, the, the resources to to uh, change change things and, and do them in a slightly more creative way. Yes, Great. because a non-lucrative visa uh, doesn't allow to 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 work in Spain, but you can work for a foreign entity. So there is a there is a a clue there. But uh, so we need to study. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Now, uh, let's see if there are any more questions in the live chat. Uh, Tony Brown. So what percentage of tax would you pay on a UK pension over the 12,000 
allowance. Yeah, what's the lower rate of tax, the first rate? Because there's a sliding scale, isn't there, above that? Depending on where you live in Spain, but... I don't Is it 19%? Know. No, I less, less. I think less. Yeah? Yes. Okay, depends where you live then. Yes. And his other question is, if I have UK savings investment as my retirement fund and I draw a yearly amount, so that's like a, a kind of an annual uh, uh, wage he's paying himself, really, uh, annual income, do I pay tax on this? That's a yes. And are there any thresholds? So it's not, it's not, it's not depending on how you draw, it depends how is the income of the year. So if if you get any, any uh, income but you don't draw anything, you should pay. So it's the the, the income that generate this uh, investment. I see. Yes. Yes. So you, only, you only pay on the on the profits. Yeah, it's not the draw. Is 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 the income that you obtain from that uh, saving is investment. Great. That's good to know. Hope uh, that it's not a cash criteria. It's not a cash. So the 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 the, the, get, the money you get is is the income of the year. so it's a bit i think it's it's a bit unclear whether um i mean i don't know what uk saving investment means um if uh, some i think we can look at two scenarios one where you have something like a fund for example and the fund uh is self-contained and it buys and sells shares but but you only own the fund you don't own this own the shares and then as long as it's everything is within the fund you haven't actually realized any gain uh, but once once uh, you sell the the fund participation units then you've realized the gain um, and equally if you, if you have a, you know for example a pure cash saving uh, instrument that pays you a regular interest and that interest uh, makes part of your overall income uh, regardless of you know where where it's uh, whether you take it out of the bank account or not, yeah. So it, it depends. Yeah, it depends on the structure. Mm. Yeah. Good. That's clear. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I've got an answer to this one, Marie. Can you apply for a work visa after the first year of being on the non-lucrative visa in Spain? <clears throat> that is a yes. It is possible. Can you apply you, for you, work visa? Yes. Yes. You can yes. change. Yeah. You have to find a job, obviously, first. <laughs> uh, and Steffi says, as a UK company sole director and sole shareholder with seven staff, should I speak to an accountant who both knows who knows both tax systems or a tax lawyer for the structure? I would speak to Fresh if I were you. That sounds like the sort of thing you would do. Yeah. You should speak to anything, anything that's international tax planning, you should speak to lawyers. Yes. Uh, I think you know on it, accountants. Accountants are doing the books, and, and they're good for uh, they're good for calculating the tax you owe. Tax planning is is a lawyer's job, unless you're unless you're a big four, uh, and they have. Uh, but but they're not really accountants. They have their own lawyers as well in, in kind of separate structures. Uh, but yeah, I mean, generally, planning tax across jurisdictions is a lawyer's job, and uh, just just kind of. Uh, um, maybe referencing this this particular scenario it's actually a very interesting uh scenario because um the, the, there's a question of whether that particular uk company once the sole director and shareholder moves to the to, to spain uh whether that that company is a, a uk tax resident or a spanish tax resident um it, it, there's a major issue of a major question of uh of corporate tax residency and if, if it's a spanish uh, tax resident, then corporation tax should be paid in Spain, uh, and income uh, and distributions will not be covered by Beca. So, and the place where a company is tax resident is normally the place where it's managed from. Yeah. So, uh, uh, normally uh, it, it would change tax residency, but perhaps uh, some of the seven staff are, are uh, um, well qualified, um, uh, trustworthy staff, and and some of them can take some management responsibilities. Yes. That's leaving the management in, in the UK and therefore the tax residency in the UK. So, yeah, an accountant won't be able to tell you that. Good to know. <clears throat> yes. uh, Jason is asking, what about the D7? Can I work in Portugal? Is that the equivalent of the non-lucrative visa? That's yeah. equivalent. Yeah, yeah, that's equivalent to a visa for those who own passive income. Okay. 
for those who are not working. So coming with a D7 and working here, that it's not exactly a possibility. Uh, normally, if you communicate that you are working, uh, Portugal, even if you ask for a D7, okay, but if you show traces that you're going to work in Portugal, they go get to a D8, which is equivalent to a digital nomad visa. Okay. And uh, Tony, what's he asking now? Capital investment bond in the UK. Oh, yes, he's, he's clarifying about what kind of savings investment he has. So he's got a capital investment bond in the UK. A withdrawal is classed as return of capital, not a gain. So is this still taxed in Spain? That, well, that would be a no if it's not a gain. I don't think so. I mean, so assuming tax has already been paid on on, uh, on that money when it was taken, uh, so income tax was paid and then uh, uh, you, you took, so I'm just kind of describing the scenario, income tax was paid, now you've taken that money and you've invested it in a bond and the bond uh, has both the capital that you've invested and it also pays you certain interest. Uh, so the, the, the original capital investment that's being returned, it's not income, um, but the interest is income. Uh, yeah. So, I, I, and that, that's, I, that, that's the position in both Spain and Portugal. It's important, I think, to, to keep records of exactly what is what. Yes, in that case in Spain, so the, the, the nature income of a capital gain in that case would be the same because it's a saving uh, rent. So that, that rent will be taxed at 19 until uh, 26%. So it's, it's not the, the, the progressive tax rate. Okay. Okay. The saving rent. Right. Uh, Lionel Knight is asking, if you're trading within a fund platform, can you claim losses against income? That's interesting. Who can answer that one? In a space. Yes, trading sure. with a fund platform, can you claim? Yes. In the same year, you can you can offset in yeah. capital gains with, with uh, losses. Yes. Yeah. In Portugal, you basically can carry on losses that were incurred and reported in Portugal as a tax resident for five years. Okay. Yeah, in Good. Spain it's the same. So the first year you can uh, offset in, and the second year you can offset if you have uh, enough money. Is a is a is a rule, a special rule, but it's uh, mm -hmm. for four years in Spain. Okay. Great. <clears throat> Okay, and a uh, quick one from Steffi. Do, do you cover the Canaries? You cover the islands? Yes, yes. Yeah, good to know. And uh, Jason asked a question right at the start of the show, so let's cover that one now. He's just reminded us, EPREM requirements, please. Uh, why, is it, uh, why is it higher in Spain? Higher than what, are you asking, Jason? We can tell you the EPREM requirements. It's um, 600... Uh, EPREM is 600 euros per month. No. That one times EPREM is 600 euros. The EPREM in Spain? Yes, per month. They change every month. <laughs> but now, now is the EPREM is uh, 1,000 euros, 1,100 euros. EPREM? No, that's 600 a month. That's the EPREM, right? No. And and you multiply it by four. So this is the amount that you need for financial requirement for the non-lucrative visa. He's talking about. For the non-lucrative visa is uh, four hundred thousand day prem. No, it's about um, for non-lucrative visa is. Uh, 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 you need four times e prem, which is two thousand four hundred. It's four times. Four month. times. Yeah. 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 So the, the actual EPREM figure, the one times EPREM is, is 600. Is there is there a no. similar kind of thing? 2004, it's 2,000... Uh, 400, yeah. It's 2,400 for the, for the person. And yeah. it's 100 for family, for each member of the family. That's right, yeah. Is there a similar thing in, in Portugal, Pedro? So for I the, need, for uh, the I need some clarity on uh, what refers EPREM because that's not uh, okay. concept here. <laughs> yeah. So for the for the D seven, um, the equivalent of the non lucrative visa, uh, uh, what is the financial requirement for for savings and passive income? Yes. 
that? Is the uh, minimum it's, salary? It, yeah, yeah. Basically, it's 760 euros. It, last year, it was 760 euros. I don't know if they have updated for 2024. Um, it yeah. was 760 euros a month. It's the minimum salary. I mean, we, we don't have, uh, uh, we don't have uh, a fancy uh, acronym. Uh, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's just, uh, I, think, uh, I think your fancy acronym might confuse Morillo as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's just the minimum salary, basically. And, uh, and, and the, the digital nomad visa is also a multiplier of, uh, of the minimum salary. There is a fancy acronym for other things. Um, uh, for example, there is um, uh, there's a tax break for uh, young people in Portugal, uh, and it's it's calculated by multiplying uh, a certain fancy acronym by twenty or something like this. Uh, because why would you just uh, list a number if you can uh, uh, if you can make it complicated? Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we don't we don't have a similar concept in Portugal. So uh, Jason's question is, but. Why is it a lot less in Portugal? Why is the financial requirement so much lower in Portugal for for somebody on that on that visa? To be more attractable. <laughs> and, and Portugal is a poorer country as well. Um, let, let's let's remember it. It's one of the poorest countries in Europe, uh, and. Uh, um, it used to be, uh, and I think you kind of you mentioned it in the beginning. It used to be that, that Portugal was generally cheaper than um, than Spain. I, I don't think that's the case anymore. It's so at, at least not in the areas where expats live. Uh, but uh, I, mean, I, I, I think Barcelona is, a, is still slightly more expensive than Lisbon, but the differences are minor. Um, it, it, it generally both both cities are very expensive, whilst. If you go to the uh, inland to, to certain places, uh, they're, they're both very cheap. Uh, I, I, I actually think that the, the real estate market is cheaper in Spain in general now than it is in Portugal. Mm -hmm. From what I've heard, yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, I think that's answered that question. Um, and I also think that Spain want to discourage um, uh, uh, people from outside Europe, certain certain people from outside Europe from coming in. It makes it um, more important for somebody wanting to move to Spain on the non-lucrative visa. It makes them, it makes it more important than that they've got more wealth that they can bring into the country. I mean, it's yeah. it's not just about bringing wealth into the country, but it's deterring people from the, on the lower end of the scale. Um, yeah. Probably. Well, the, the, I mean, tax is, tax is one way. I mean, you can, you can deal with it either on the immigration side or, or on the tax side. Uh, and the uh, tax rate for retirees um, in Portugal uh, under the NHR used to be zero. Uh, then it was raised to 10% and, and now it's on the progressive scale. So now if, if you come to Portugal, uh, you have to pay uh, full tax uh, as a retiree. But, I, you know, I think that um uh the the the, the, the kind of these countries are thinking well you, you know what we we really should be encouraging people who are uh working also because we're losing population it's in portugal it is a huge problem um it's 30 percent of the youth are leaving so uh if you're um uh, if you're making your own population leave by taxing them to death and uh, and you're you're bringing in other people to replace them, then you need to bring people to replace them who can actually uh, uh, replace them. So, uh, yeah. so yeah. But but it's uh, I, 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 at least from an immigration perspective, Portugal is still very easy. Um, uh, and yeah, the, the threshold is very low. And um, mm -hmm. and if you the threshold in Spain, it's also easy. I mean, still the the the, the gates are open in both of these countries to, to accept more people. Yeah. Very true. Okay, we're, we're getting towards the, the hour and a half mark and I don't really want to go over that because it'll be a very difficult video for everybody to watch all the way through. So um, I, I think we'll, we'll end it with the questions that I had planned um, uh, for now and ask if anybody on the live chat has any more questions to ask them now. And while we're waiting for that, um, let me just remind you that if you have any more questions or comments after we go off the air, put them in the YouTube comments below 
don't put them on some random Facebook expat group where nobody can find them. Uh, put them underneath the video and then everybody who watches the video can get those answers and be helped by it. So there are, there's at least one question here already. Lionel Knights is asking, with the D7 visa in Portugal, can you still obtain an NHR? If this has changed, what are the tax breaks available? So, Pedro. So, uh, the NHR has ended last year, uh, but there is still a transitional period on 2024. Uh, basically, if you become a tax resident in 2024, you can still apply to the NHR if you meet one of the requirements in law. And one of those requirements could have been requested at D7 visa, for example, uh, but it must be requested and you must have an appointment with the immigration authorities uh, the, scheduled by the end of the last year. So you must have initiated this D7 process last year and you also, and you basically change your tax residency to Portugal in 2024, you can still apply to the NHR. It is possible. If you can't uh, approve that, if you haven't started your immigration procedure, you can get a D7, but you won't be able to apply for the NHR. The tax breaks wow. available really depends on your streams of income in this case. There is no standard for it. You might uh, be interested on TISRI, but as I've said, it's uh, uh, basically very, very... Uh, uh, um, uh, it's very, very focused on people who are coming to work. If you're using a D7 visa, the probabilities of, you know, being be, being used in TSRI uh, uh, are quite reduced. But uh, there are always uh, 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 solutions, depending specifically on your case, on your streams of income, that might reduce your taxes. They probably won't be good as NHR, of course, but there is always solutions to that. I, I'll just add that if you own a property in Portugal, that's another criteria that gets you in under the, yeah. the, the transitional period. So if, if you've owned the property uh, before the 10th of October 2023, that's the, the cutoff date that they've decided for uh, a reason known only to them, <laughs> uh, then uh, you can still apply for NHR, but you have to come in 2024. Yep. So if, uh, if, someone, if someone owns a property uh, and we're considering a move, um, now is the time to act. Great. So, I think we'll uh, we'll we'll go around the board and ask each of you one final question, and that basically is, if you were uh, a UK resident and you were thinking of moving to Spain or Portugal, which one would you choose? <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with you, Marilla. <laughs> 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 I would say Spain, but <laughs> I thought you might. Fair <laughs> for them, but uh, I think it's a very difficult question. So it depending on each people. So if your main objective is to avoid taxes, so you should focus on taxes. But if you if you you appreciate another thing, so as uh, I don't know the fathers or the flamenco so i don't know it's very very difficult yes. good answer yes pedro what about you well uh, as marilo well mentioned it depends on the circumstances of uh, each person who is thinking of migrating right uh, uh, if you focus on taxes uh you should first of all uh, try to consult with someone who can analyze your case specifically, depending on your framework. Maybe Spain will be better, maybe Portugal will. And of course, as also well mentioned by Marilo, uh, the cultural difference might impact the, uh, your choice, right? And studying the country, studying their culture, studying how they behave, and, 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 and see where you will get used to, to, to the cultural differences might be more relevant than where you're going to save uh, 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 a little bit more of taxes, but certainly I would choose Portugal. Certainly I would come for it, and uh, I will leave Zev to be the tiebreaker. I'm the only one who's, who's actually been a UK tax resident, <laughs> yeah. um, yes, and, uh, and resident. And uh, I, I, I tend to I tend to like everywhere. So uh, you know, I think both countries are amazing. I was considering uh, moving to uh, to Spain, and then I was stuck in Portugal uh, during the pandemic, and ended up in Portugal somehow. Uh, so I really, I really like both countries. I think they're both great. 
um, and uh, and I like the UK as well. It just rains all the time. So um, uh, I, 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 I suspect. Well, who knows? You know, you, you never know uh, what, what happens. But uh, I have a, I have a home in the UK, and I go back very often. Um, but um, I, I, there's there's the, the the cultural difference is actually huge. You know, the systems are not that different, but the cultural difference is huge. Yeah. Uh, it, it, the Spain and it, for me, uh, if I need to simplify, it, Spain's more fun. Uh, it has more to do. Uh, it's it's the, the culture is more vibrant, uh, and and people are more outgoing. Uh, Portugal is easier in my mind. Uh, the, the system is is more forgiving. It's less aggressive, uh, as it, particularly when it comes to tax. It's uh, it's just everything is just slightly more relaxed. Uh, so if you're looking for a kind of a a, a, a more relaxed, uh, uh, a more smooth transition. Uh, also, pe people in if you, if you want to, if, if you're coming to Spain, you really need to learn Spanish. Uh, in in Portugal, people speak English as a rule. Um, still, you know, you're much better off learning Portuguese. But it's it's both harder because it's a very difficult language, and it's uh, it's it's less necessary. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it's. It's easier to move to Portugal, I think, but you know, perhaps it's more fun to move to Spain and you know, do whatever you want with that information. Good answer. So, thanks everybody for all of your questions. And um, so, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much to all of my guests, to Marlo, Pedro, and Zev. And um, uh, before we find out what's on next week's show, everybody give them a Give them a wave and a massive virtual hug and a kiss. Thanks so much, guys, for being on. Does anyone have any, any last words to say before we go? Well, sounds, yeah. good, sounds, sounds morbid, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. for. Thank for you very time. much. Yeah, we appreciate it. Yeah, it, was good. it was good fun. It was, uh, it, was, it was a better uh, Saturday morning than I expected. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> good stuff. Okay. I've yeah, I, I haven't actually told my wife about this, so I, I kind of <laughs> I jumped from bed this morning, and she, because you know we're an hour behind, she was like, you know, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> yes, did she believe you? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see if my key still works on the way back. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. All right then. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, guys. Bye-bye bye. for now. There we go. Thanks so much to all of you on the live chat. Uh, let's find out who we've got on the show next week. Well, all of you regulars will know every fortnight we have Chris from Upsticks, and of course he will be back next week. Uh, we'll be chatting about updates and news and all of the stuff you need to know about visas and residency and anything else you want to chat about as well. We'll pick out a special topic to cover during the week. Thank you to the four people who've hovered over the uh, the QR code at the corner and uh, bought a bought me a, a coffee.com. And um, have your questions ready for any subject for next week or just prepare yourself for a lovely chat. And in the meantime, you can ask questions in advance on our Facebook page and group or under any of the videos. Don't forget to smash the like button down there. And um, thanks for everybody who's watching back afterwards and leaving comments and hitting the like button and buying me a coffee.com. I'll see you either on the midweek video on Wednesday or the video diary on Fridays or live next Saturday morning at the regular time of nine o'clock if you're in the UK or Ireland or Portugal or the Canaries or 10 o'clock in the morning if you're in Spain or Central Europe. And that's all for this week. Somebody pass around the taxation comparison cookies. And here's one final message from all of us here at U2 Spain. Bye. Goodbye. Toodaloo. Peace and love. Peace and fluff. Oi oi. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. One more cosmic dance? All right then. Look, mum, I'm dancing. Oh, I'm all a quiver. Let's dance.